there's a radical change away from this globalized um, free so-called free market economy mm. which is based on the idea that we can keep extracting wild molecules from Gaia for as long as we like and in any quantities that we like. This idea of limitless exploitation of nature, which is the fundamental assumption in our economic system, would be abandoned. It's clearly unsustainable. And instead, we'd, moved, uh, we'd move away from that kind of suicidal growth to what I call intelligent growth, in which what grows is, first of all, on a psychological level, love of Gaia, connection to place, um, a massive relocalization of food production, of industry, uh, and of community. You don't have to be an animist to adopt this. You can be a mechanist, and, but still understand the need for it. Mm. But if you're an animist, um, it makes it easier, and it gives it more meaning. Because then the whole Earth and the whole cosmos is fundamentally meaningful. Mm. And there's no longer a split between human culture and nature. Culture goes, in this view, would permeates everything. Humans have a certain kind of culture, but so do bacteria, so do trees, so do birds, and so indeed does the whole earth. So this animistic perspective allows us to dissolve the, the dichotomy between ourselves and the rest of nature. And this gives us fantastic motivation, energy, and uh, satisfaction. So we would relocalize on a massive level the huge transportation networks that we now require to move food around would disappear, much of the food would be produced locally. Most of our clothes, uh, most of our industrial products, of course there'd be far fewer of those, would be produced locally. Um, and wild nature would be allowed to regrow, no more of it would be cut down. Our agriculture, of course, would be not like it is now, with vast inputs of fertilizers and chemicals. It would be more like what's known as permaculture, which is where you grow lots of different species, all of them useful, together to mimic the synergies that you find in a wild ecosystem. Uh, it's been very well proven and very highly productive all over the world. And at the same time, we would probably be strongly motivated to carry out some geoengineering. Because as I keep saying, I think the time has come to, uh, to take radical steps to prevent the runaway warming from getting too severe. Do you really believe this, this is some plausible Scenario? I don't think we've got an option. We have to do this, otherwise our civilization simply won't survive. So it's not about going back to a previous state of existence, you know, say pre-industrial existence. It's going moving forwards into a new, thoroughly exciting, mm. thoroughly challenging um, situation full of possibilities that we haven't plumbed before in our culture. What it'll mean is that we'll have to reconnect not just with the earth more, but with each other more. We'll have to find our satisfaction not so much through our computer screens, but through face-to-face -face interaction, through storytelling, through music making, through community, and through connection with the earth. All of us will have to be involved who are able-bodied with food production in our local area for at least one or two hours a day. Um, we'll all have to really allow nature to regrow in our local regions and really develop an intimate knowledge of our local regions. We'll have to create low stories again about, if you like, uh, the spirits in the local trees, about the local rivers, about the local mountains and valleys. We'll have to recreate rich local cultures once more. I, what I'm trying to do, like many others, is to uh, heal this terrible mistake that we made in our culture around about the time of the scientific revolution, more or less, when we began to seriously believe that the Earth is nothing more than a dead machine. Not just the Earth, but the whole cosmos. You know, um, when Rene Descartes' followers cut open live dogs and the dogs screamed in pain, Descartes said to his followers, ignore the screams, they are merely the creakings of a machine. So, you can understand what a travesty it is to deny your spontaneous feelings of sympathy for a dog as in screaming in pain in that way, simply because you believe it's a machine. So we believe that the whole earth is a machine, that the whole earth is just there for us, that we humans are the only species with sentience, and that everything in the earth, all the trees, the forests, the, the rocks, the minerals, are all there for us to exploit.
that we've actually been placed here on this earth to use the scientific method and scientific rationality to exploit the earth merely for human benefit. And it's no surprise that 400 years later, uh, we now have this tremendous crisis. I'll say that again. It's no surprise that after living under the influence of this worldview for 400 years, no, so it's no surprise that after living for 400 years under the influence of this worldview, that we now have this phenomenal crisis. So we need an antidote to the mechanistic worldview. I don't mean to say we, we should abandon it, because it's a useful way of seeing the world for certain purposes. It's useful as a tool, but it's not useful as the guiding metaphor for, for an entire culture. <clears throat> so we need to look for a metaphor that is more appropriate. And in order to do that, we can look either to other cultures or dig down into the history of our own culture, like doing a sort of cultural archaeology, and look for ideas <clears throat> that could serve to become, once again, the appropriate metaphor. And the idea of anima mundi is the most suitable. That comes from uh, ancient Greeks. In fact, they, they spoke not Latin. Anima mundi is Latin, but Greek. They used to talk about psyche cosmu. Plato writes about this in the Timaeus. Psyche cosmu, the psyche of the cosmos. And we've touched on this idea earlier, that the whole cosmos is sentient, that everything is so subject. Everything is capable of experience. Everything is, in some sense... Um, carbon princes... Um, yes. Calcium princesses, um, algae... And yes, all of those things. I mean, I don't mean to say that carbon actually is a prince, or that calcium actually is a princess. I'm trying to breathe some kind of animistic language into the discourse. Mm -hmm. You could come up with another story. What matters is not the actual details of the story, but the intention and the spirit mm. behind the atmosphere and the relationship that the story evokes when you hear it. If you, listen, if you read a standard chemical text about carbon dioxide, it'll probably send you to sleep. It's incredibly dry and brittle. Very interesting, of course, if you've developed a scientific outlook, but very dry and brittle and incapable of inspiring anyone but the most arcane ivory tower academic. But if you take those same facts and tell them animistically, as I have tried to do, talking about Carmen as a prince and calcium as a princess, suddenly you begin to see these chemical elements as beings that relate to each other, just like we do, as beings that try to find satisfaction in their existences, much as we do. And suddenly, in my experience of teaching Gaia in this way, the whole subject becomes alive and becomes three-dimensional and relational, and people can suddenly begin to understand and relate to the world that they're deeply embedded in. And this brings about a complete relationship with the rest of the world, in which you realize that the world is indeed alive, a great organism. And this gives you a tremendous sense of participation in the world, which is empowering and full of meaning. 